the next several weeks, you're going to have an opportunity to hear just a real brief testimony from each of the five gentlemen that are deacon candidates. Uh, this is the first one today, and I want to present to you Steve Steven. Uh, Steve has been a deacon at previous churches, and he's going to talk a little bit about that to you. Uh, but we are so glad to have Steve. Steve, why don't you come up here and let me pray for you, and then you share with the folks a little bit about yourself. Father, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here this morning to hear from Steve. We thank you for the calling on his life, and Lord, what you're doing in his life and the way you want to use him in the life of your church. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm not a public speaker. I'm going to put my hand in my pocket so I don't wave around here like uh, some wild bird or something. So, um, new to Oakdale, uh, Carolyn and I, my wife, pretty wife out here, we moved about a year and a half ago to Oakdale. We're six miles northeast of here on Memorial Road. Um, a life experience, we've just kind of had a change of life and uh, we moved up here. We joined the church back uh, Thanksgiving uh, 2018 year, just a little over a year ago. Um, I'm a little different uh, as far as a deacon candidate because I started my life as a ba as a uh, Catholic. That uh, my father, I, I consider a devout Catholic. We went to church every time we were supposed to be at church, uh, and uh, but uh, sprinkled as a, a youth, as a child, and then uh, as a youth, uh, going through the catechism classes and being confirmed as a Catholic at about the age of 13. So, but that was the previous life, I guess. We went, uh, I went to college, Stillwater, Oklahoma State, go Pokes, there we go. Um, anyway, while I was there, I, I did the typical college thing, I kind of drifted away. Dad wasn't there to say it's time to get up and go to church, so I didn't get up and go to church. And uh, just about the start of my junior year, I was at one of uh, Stillwater's finest uh, college establishments, and uh, I asked this pretty blonde girl to uh, two-step with me. And I guess we've been two-stepping together ever since then. So, uh, she, uh, she was Baptist, you know, and about every girl I'd ever dated was Baptist, because I guess there's just a lot more Baptists than there are Catholics in Oklahoma. So, but uh, on my 21st birthday, Something unexpected happened. She gave me a Bible for, for my birthday. And I, it was my first Bible. I had never really opened a Bible up to that point. You can be Catholic and not open a Bible. Um, on the inside cover, she had handwritten the Jeremiah 2911. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a a hope and a future and uh, I guess that started my future we got married at, uh, at uh, First Baptist Church Oklahoma City a beautiful chapel there Our, and uh, I guess in 84 when we were got uh, out of college there was just a, it was a downturn in the economy here so we made our way down to Dallas to start our married career together um, Looking around, we visited several churches, and we, we decided uh, First Baptist Church, Grand Prairie. We were in Mid-Cities, if you know where Grand Prairie is, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and that's where we joined. And uh, 34 years later, we were still members there. But we had two sons, raised our boys. We, were, we, we had them at church every time the doors were open. And as a Catholic, we didn't do a whole lot of this... Uh, children's church or children's camp youth camp those kind of things well I've made up for it I've got countless t-shirts from probably seven straight years of children's camp and then going to youth camp and doing mission trips uh, I guess you could say I kind of fell into church I'm a full-blown Baptist now but uh, about uh, 15 plus years ago I was uh, ordained as a deacon there and I just say, God has plans. We've known from all the beginning that God had plans. We built our retirement home. We were going to be in Grand Prairie for the duration. But God kind of directed our plans elsewhere. Things, 
very quickly started falling into place that we needed to, we, we knew we needed to be back home. Both of our parents were, uh, all four of our parents were still alive, but her mother was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia about four plus years ago. And we knew there was going to be some need there for some assistance. My parents are both alive in Oklahoma, or in Tulsa. So uh, just through a chain of events, we moved back to Oklahoma to help out with uh, aging parents. But it is God's plan in that in the last year we were here, uh, Carolyn got to be with her mother as she declined. Uh, she passed away just last summer. I got the opportunity, the blessing to spend with my mother uh, just the last week. She's been in the hospital, fell, broke several, couple of vertebrae in her back, and I was able to be here to be with her. So God's got plans, and uh, that's where we are today. I guess I'm here. I've been ordained as a deacon, so I'm asking, I guess, your permission to be an active deacon here. That This is our church home now. Uh, we plan on staying here for a while, but unless God has other plans. So uh, if you allow me to pray, we'll, get some, we'll let the, the band keep going here. Father God, I do thank you for a new church home that, uh, that we can be a part of to grow in. I thank you for all the staff here. I thank you for Jamie and all the musicians that uh, bring us into the throne room every Sunday morning that uh, we can praise and worship your name. Father, I thank you for Justin, uh, that he's suffering for the Lord right now in Florida. But uh, Father God, I just thank you that he's, he's there to, to help us, knowing where to go in the next few years. Father, to be with Paul today as he's bringing our message. Father, help to prepare his heart. Give him your words that we may, uh, that we may just search for those words, that we can apply them to our lives today. Father, for the rest of the staff, for Jimmy, for, for Alan, for Sarah, for Marjorie, for all those that are in the, in the behind scenes that make things happen that we don't even know about. Father, I just thank you for this church, for its future, and that may we follow those plans. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, band. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate your words. And uh, I know that over coming days, you'll look forward to hearing from the other guys and uh, how God has brought them to this point. Um, it's an exciting time in the life of our church as God begins to do that. As it was mentioned, Justin is suffering in Florida today. Um, actually, I think he told me he looked at the forecast and it was supposed to be a little bit warmer here than it is there. So... Um, but uh, but we're, he is uh, having a great opportunity which was presented to him. Um, he is meeting with five or six other pastors from around the country, and the five or six of them are meeting with Thomas Rayner. Thomas Rayner is uh, he's kind of the guru of Baptist statistics. Um, he is a church growth guy in the Baptist world and has written many, many books, some great stuff, and encourage you to pick up any of his things to study really good. But they're going to kind of have an intimate time of just the five or six of them with uh, Dr. Rayner. So I think it's going to be a great time for him. And in essence, it'll be good for us as well. So we're glad about that. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Peter. We're going to be spending a little bit of time in 1 Peter this morning, uh, the first chapter. And uh, we're going to continue our look at some of these frequently asked questions, okay? And the question that we want to ask today is, how to relate, how, how do we rightly relate to God? How do we rightly relate to God? You ever thought about that? We all wear different hats, don't we, to relate to different groups of people that we're dealing with or that we're working with or whatever it is that we're doing we wear a family hat when we're at home and we have family things to do. We, we put on our professional hat when we go to work and do those kinds of things. And so we have to relate to different groups of people throughout our day, throughout our life. And so how do we do that in terms of God? How do we relate to almighty, all-knowing, creator of all, king of the universe? How do we his creation, relate to him. And I, I want us to look at, at some things this morning I think will help us kind of begin to, to wrap our heads around that. At the, 
We're going we're gonna to be in verses 17 down through verse 21 of 1 Peter chapter 1, but we're also going to look at uh, the first few verses ahead of that, beginning in verse 13. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of God's word, if you would, and, um, and look with me beginning in uh, verse 13. And I may have flip-flop, but you're good? Okay. Let's look at verse 13 there, and uh, we'll go from there all the way down to verse 21. Word of God says this, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, get this, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. And then verse 16, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Now, beginning of verse 17 down through verse 21 is our main scripture we want to look at today. And it says this, if you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from the futile way of your life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he has foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time to spend in your word. I pray that as we spend these next few moments that you will speak to us in a very clear, very concise way. I pray that this scripture is very fresh to us today. I know we have read this before, but God, I pray it is very fresh to us this morning. I pray that you will give me remembrance of your word, of your scripture, that we might preach it and proclaim it. Maybe, Father, as this is the last time to ever get to preach or proclaim your word. God, I beg you to get me out of the way, that we will truly only hear you and see you and experience you this morning. Speak to us right now, for we're listening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So some very interesting things are happening in this passage of Scripture, and, and Peter uh, lines out some things for us that I think are very important for us to get. And the first thing I want us to get in, in how do we rightly relate to God, well, the first thing we need to look at is we have to jump back there to verse 16. And in verse 16, when it says, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. How in the world do we do that? How in the world do we do that? Listen, I know you, you know me, not to the extent that we know each other intimately. But I know this about myself. I'm not holy. Okay, I, I know this about my family. We're not holy. I, I know this about Justin. He's not holy. Okay, listen, I know this about you. You're not holy. Right? But yet, that's what we're called to be. That's, that's how we're called to live. So how do we do this? How do we, how do we rightly relate? The first thing I want us to, to look at is, is this. This is really three uh, keys to rightly relating to God. The first is this. Recognize God as Father. Recognize God as Father. Now, we talked a little bit about that last week some. But I want us to look a, um, a little bit differently or a little deeper at what this says in, in relation to recognizing God as Father. In verse 17, we read this. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. And let's talk about that for just a second. Recognize God as Father. Do you have the right... To call God Father. That's a question we all have to ask ourselves. Do we have the right to call God Father? You may say that a, that's a strange question. 
But we need to look at what exactly this verse is saying. You see, in the original Greek, the first part of this verse, verse 17, is translated, since you call God Father, or because you have the right to call God Father. That tells me that if I have the right to call God Father, then I also have the right not to be called Him Father. I'm also able not to have the right to call Him Father. Father. Now that's shocking to some folks. Some folks would say, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. God created it all, so uh, because God is Father of all, then we all can call Him Father. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says, well, since you have been given the right, since you have the right to call Him Father, then you can call Him Father. But not everybody has that right to call Him Father. There's this idea going around that a lot subscribe to, and that is that God is the universal father of man and therefore all men are brothers. That God is the creator of all but not the father of all. Hear me when I say that. God is the creator of all, but he is not the father of all. So the question then becomes, who can call God father? Only those that have been born into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord can call God Father. Hear that. Only those that have been born into the faith by accepting Christ and recognizing that He is Savior, Redeemer, the living God, have placed their faith in Him. Those are the ones that have the right To call God Father. Okay? If you want to rightly relate to an almighty God, if you want to rightly relate to the creator of all, you have to admit that you're not holy, that you're a sinner, and you have to surrender yourself to Jesus. Okay? That's the only way to relate to God. That's the only way to be able to recognize him as Father. The idea that God is the creator of all is true, but the idea that we are all one brotherhood is false. You see, church, there is only one brotherhood which the Almighty recognizes, and that is the brotherhood that is in Jesus Christ. Jesus is King and Lord, and only those that have placed their faith in Him can call Him Father. When you and I accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are born into a brand new family. We are born into a family of God. And from that moment on, we know God, the the creator of the universe, the father of, of all of us who have accepted Jesus as our Savior. We know him on an intimate level. We know him like no nobody else can know him. Having having the God of all as our Father brings us some benefits. You ever stopped and thought about that? You know, when I was growing up, my dad was pastor of uh, several churches in the area, but he pastored the Village Baptist Church for many years, almost 14, almost 15 years. And, uh, and as a result of that, um, he knew a lot of folks. And I was a young guy growing up there, and I had the opportunity to meet a lot of different, very important people in our state um, and really even around the world because dad had some relationships with those people. And so I'd get up in the morning sometimes and he'd say, hey, I'm going to have a meeting with such and such. Would you like to come with me and meet this individual? Absolutely, I'd love to do that. So we'll get to go and go with him and meet some of these important folks in our state, around our world, all because of my father. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. They probably didn't even want to know me. But I had a father, and because of that relationship, I had some benefits. I got to meet some of these important people. Listen, when we have God, the creator of universe of the universe, as our father, it brings some benefits. The first is this. He's there and willing to hear and answer our prayers. He wants to hear from you. He wants to answer your prayers. Listen, he forgives our sins when we repent and ask him with a humble heart. Listen, we we all mess up, don't we? 
do, do this with me. Okay? Every one of us messes up. Don't you want someone who is going to kneel beside you and say, my son or my daughter, I love you. And because I love you, since you have come to me humbly and asked for forgiveness, I forgive you. Don't you want that? I want that. I need that. I need a father who's going to forgive me. I need a father who's going to wrap his arms around me when I've messed up and I know it. And he's going to offer forgiveness to me. I, I don't know how it is in your house. But in my house, <clears throat> of course, we have our daughter McKenna. And McKenna's 21. She's up and going to school. She's out the door. I see her, you know, when she comes in. Oh, I have a daughter, right? So I get to see McKenna. Will's 18, he's up and out, he's doing stuff in school, and so I, I see him when he comes in between, you know, a couple hours here, and then he goes off to baseball. But at home, most of the time now, there's the nine-year-old Lizzie, and then there is the five-year-old Blaze, right? And in my house, most of the time, the parenting that's going on from day-to-day -day basis is with a nine-year-old and a five-year-old. That's totally different than parenting that goes on with an 18-year-old and a 21-year-old, right? So we're juggling a lot of balls in our house. And what happens in our house routinely is, as it does in any house with a five-year-old, five-year-olds mess up, don't they? They just mess up. And why is that? Because they're five. And so when a five-year-old's mess up, you have to deal with them a little bit differently than you deal with an 18-year-old who messes up, or a 21-year-old who messes up, or a almost 48-year-old who messes up. And with a five-year-old, you have to kneel down, and you have to wrap your arms around them. And you have to say, I know that you messed up. And you know you messed up but I love you. And because I love you, I'm going to help you learn not to mess up again. I'm going to punish you because you messed up. But I love you too much to let you keep messing up. You see, we have a God who wraps his arms around us and says, I love you. And I'm going to help you not mess up. And in fact, we're going to talk about that just here in a moment. How he helps us not to mess up. But he forgives us and he loves us when we repent. And we ask him with a humble heart to forgive us. He corrects us when we need it, doesn't he? That's a benefit of a father. He corrects us when we need it. And he meets our physical and emotional and spiritual needs. That's what he does. Sometimes with a five-year-old, you have to say, you know what? You don't deserve anything that you have in your room right now, right? Sometimes you say, there's not one thing that you deserve. In fact, what I'm required to give you is food, shelter, and clothing. That's it. Aren't you glad that we have a father that says, I want to meet your needs spiritually, I want to meet your needs physically. I want to meet your needs emotionally. I want to wrap my arms around you and give you all the benefits of being a son or a daughter of the God of the universe. That's what we have when we recognize God as Father. Second key in relating to God rightly is recognize God as judge. Recognize God as judge. When we as Christians think of God's judgment, typically two things come to mind. As believers, when we think about God's judgment, there's a couple of things that if you've been raised in the church, you kind of you think of these two things. The first thing is uh, the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ, you'll, you can read about that in 2 Corinthians 5, 
verse 10, you can read a little bit more about the judgment seat of Christ. This is a time when Christians will stand before God to be determined how faithful we've been in serving Jesus Christ through our life. This is the judgment seat of Christ. On that basis of our judgment, then it's determined what rewards we'll receive. Okay, that's what we read about in 2 Corinthians. That's the judgment seat of Christ. All Christians will stand before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. The second seat of judgment or the second uh, thing we think about a lot in, in, in relation to judgment is the great white throne of judgment. If you're a believer and been in the church and have read, you have heard about the great white throne of judgment. Here's what happens at the great white throne of judgment. Only those who rejected Christ will appear at this judgment seat. Only those that turned their back on Christ, rejected him, will appear at this judgment. And there they will, be, they will receive their judgment of eternity separated from God and all that is good. Pretty serious. Two judgment seats of Christ. The third or the, the kind of judgment that Peter is talking about here or had in mind here is the kind of judgment that God is carrying on right now. So look with me beginning in, uh, in verse 17 again, when it says this, if you address as father, okay, we talked about that, the one who, is, who impartially judges according to each one's work. Now let's stop right there and, and look at that for just a second. You see, we live our lives each day as we're being judged, or at least we should. We should live our lives each day as if we're being judged. We are being judged on how faithful we are in our service to Christ. In other words, how involved are we in making our time, our talents, and our treasures count for Christ? That's the question. How involved are we in making these things count? You see, God is not impressed with how successful we are in life. We, we don't get bonus points because we make a lot of money, right? Right? That, that, that stuff doesn't mean anything to God. He, he owns it all, right? So, so that kind of stuff doesn't mean anything. God expects us to serve Christ regardless of how successful we are or how unsuccessful we are. The word judge here in this, in this passage is the Greek word krino, and it means to judge that which is good, to judge that which is good. So combine that with the idea of God as our Father. We can see that our Father is a judge looking for something to judge us that is good, okay? He's looking to judge us on good things. Now, let me take you back to the five-year-old. When the five-year-old gets in trouble and you have to bend down and you have to wrap your arms around him, you have to go through those steps of saying, I love you and I do and I want you to grow up to be successful and I want you to grow up to be all these great things. The most important thing I want you to do is to grow up to love Jesus. Okay, that's what, we want them to, that's what we want them to do, right? We want, we want all our kids to be successful. We want them all to be better than we were. But the most important thing we could ever want for our children is for them to love Christ with all their heart. Okay, that's what we want, right? So when you are dressing with the five-year-old and you say, listen, buddy, this is what I want for you. This is how I want you to live. This is how I want you to grow. The most important thing that I could ever want for them is to judge them on their love for Jesus. How much do you love him? How are you giving your life for him? And as they become older, 18, 21, then you can really say, how much are you giving your life for him? When you're almost 48, you can look in the mirror and say, how much am I giving my life for him? God, the Father is looking to judge us on these good things. It's so important to notice the command that we see in verse 17. Verse 17 says, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon earth. Conduct yourself in fear. To understand this command, we need to understand two very important words 
that Peter uses here. The first is the word stay. In verse 17 when it says, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during your time, during your stay on earth. That word stay, it comes from a Greek word which means to temporarily visit a foreign land. Temporarily visit a foreign land. This is important to these people, particularly to these people, because they understood what it meant when Peter was writing this. They understood what it meant to be foreigners in the land. So, so when Peter's writing this and he's telling them, understand what it means to stay, to be, to be a visitor in this foreign land. But then he uses another word, and it's the word fear. That word fear comes from a Greek word phobos. You've heard that word before where we get our word phobia. But here the word fear or the word phobos means to have reverence, to have respect. One commentator that I read this week, he wrote this and I'll quote him um, because it really helped me to understand what fear and reverence meant. He said this, reverence is the attitude of the mind of the man who is always aware That he is in the presence of God. Think about that for just a second. I'm going to read it again. Reverence is the attitude, or you could say fear. Fear is the attitude of the mind of the man who is always aware that he is in the presence of God. Let me ask you something. If we had that kind of fear, do you think it would change how we relate to God? Do you think it would change how we relate to one another? If we're always of the mindset that we're in the presence of God. Well, here's a mind-blowing thing for you. We are. We are in the presence of God. Our day-to-day life, we're in the presence of God. How we raise our children, we're in the presence of God. What we do at work, we're in the presence of God. How we relate to a coworker, we're in the presence of God. How we relate to our husband or our wife, we're in the presence of God. See, folks, when we begin to understand to have that kind of fear, that kind of reverence, And Peter tells us in verse 17 when he says, conduct yourselves in fear. Conduct yourself in this reverence during the time of your stay on earth. While you're just a foreigner in this land, conduct yourself in reverence. While you're just visiting, conduct yourself in fear. Recognize God as our judge. Thirdly, Very quickly, if we're going to rightly relate to God, we must recognize God as our redeemer. Recognize him as our redeemer. Only as we know him as our redeemer can we know him as father. The the redemption of God that has been provided for us saves us from an empty and vain life. Listen, everything you do apart from God is empty and vain. Your life will be completely empty and vain apart from the redemption that Jesus offers to us. Only through Christ can we experience this kind of redemption. The word vain actually means striving for something that's never achieved. And that's what life is apart from Christ. People outside of Christ are constantly striving for happiness. They're constantly looking for satisfaction, but they're never going to make it. They're never going to find it. Regardless of how successful a lost person may be in his or her professional life, it's all empty, it's all in vain when measured to eternity. You think about eternity. I was having a conversation with um, our kids here around New Year's, and we were talking about all the, all the hubbub of Y2K. Remember that? Remember that? I mean, I mean, I had a buddy of mine who completely rewired his house that run completely off of generators because of Y2K. 
Now, some of our students are here going, what in the world is Y2K? Okay. Y2K was at the turn of 2000, everybody thought that the world was going to come to an end because computers would stop altogether. Did they? No. Now, hold on. Y2K happened 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Did it go by like that? Wait till eternity. You see, in eternity with Christ, it's going to go like that. Because every day will be in the presence of our Redeemer. Because every day we'll kneel before a holy God. And because we've placed our faith in him, and because we have trusted and believed in him, when we kneel before a holy God and he says, be holy as I am holy, we can say, I am holy because of your son. I am holy because of Jesus. You want to rightly relate to God? Rightly relate to Jesus. Know that he loves you more than anything in this world. Listen, you could have been coming to this church, well, almost 100 years now. But if you don't know Jesus, it's in vain. You could be a member of Saint school classes and community groups. You can do all the right things in the community. You can have a great professional life. You can make all the money in the world. But unless you know Jesus, it's in vain. You want to rightly relate to a holy God? You want to be holy as he is holy? Know Jesus. Know him as redeemer. Know him as lover of your soul. Know him as a forgiver of sins. Know him as the one that will never, ever leave you alone. Know Jesus. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes. And this is a time for you to respond. This is a time for you to respond to, to who Christ is and what Christ wants to do in your life. You see, our you see, folks, our, our redemption was purchased with a very high price. In fact, Peter tells us in this passage, he, he actually mentions it in a negative way, the price in a negative way and a positive way. He, he tells us, you were not redeemed with perishable things like gold and silver. You were not redeemed of those things that will burn up, that will pass away. You were not redeemed of those things that will not last. But he foreknew you for the foundations of the world. And you were redeemed with the precious blood as a lamb, unblemished, spotless, the blood of Christ. That's what you're redeemed with. We're going to have a time of responding to our Savior this morning. And this is a time for you to respond, not to me, not to Jamie, but a time to respond to Christ. You want to know God? Know Jesus. Know His Son. Trust in Jesus. Let Him redeem you from your sins. clean you from all unrighteousness. For just a moment, we're going to pray, and we're going to stand, and we're going to sing, and just for a very short time, this will be an opportunity for you to respond. And maybe you want to come and let me pray with you and show you how you can trust in Christ, or maybe you want to come and use these altars and spend a few moments in prayer and ask God to help you live holy as He is holy. Ask God to help you live in fear, in reverence, as if in the very presence of Jesus. Father, we come to you right now very grateful, very thankful for the opportunity to hear your word, to study your word. 
And Lord, we are so incredibly thankful that you've given us the opportunity to live in fear, to live in reverence while we're on this earth. Lord, our time here is not long. 20 years goes by in a hurry. But God, while we're here, let us recognize our Father. Let us recognize our Judge. And Lord, let us recognize our Redeemer. Lord, if there is one here this morning that needs to give their life to you, I pray that today would be their day. And Lord, it may be, and I recognize there are many believers in this room, and maybe today they need to just stop and say, Father, I want to be holy as you are holy. I recognize you as Redeemer, and I repent of my sin. And Lord, I want to live as in the very presence of you every day. Help me to do that. Father, I pray that today we make that commitment. Lord, thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray.